Oh my gosh, you guys, I am so excited. But what am I getting? You're about to find out with an unboxing. You don't need to see me that close. I apologize. Welcome to the green room. I'm Bob Bledsoe. Say hi to my brother Kent behind the camera. He likes to have a camera between himself and the snakes. My RCA VHS camcorder is pretty sweet and it does have a number of functions like autofocus, but honestly, it would be no help if I were to take a deadly bite from a python. Kent, we're adding a snake. You know, I wish you wouldn't. I know. I've hinted in live streams and other places that it's not called green room ball pythons. And that's because I knew that I wanted to get into other python species eventually. So we're gonna cut to a Kent's corner now. And while we're there, put in the comment section what you think I'm picking up today. What species of python do you think I'm picking up? And don't cheat by forwarding through the video first because, you know, Santa's watching. Hi. This is uh, Kent's Corner, the show that is everyone's favorite. Bob made me look up names of different python species so that I could tell you about them. I don't recommend any of these species unless you care nothing of the safety of yourself and your neighborhood. Carpet python attacks you from the cover of your shag carpeting. Fantastic. Green tree python. They're now attacking from jumping out of the... Ball python, most dangerous of them all, as you know. Reticulated python, they reticulate on you. You can ask any of their victims what it's like to be reticulated on and how long they spent in the intensive care unit. Children's python, great, now we're naming snakes after what they have a taste for. Fantastic. Burmese python, you know how sometimes you do a Google search and it'll show you a picture even though you didn't ask to see a picture of it? Well, it showed me a picture of one of these. That's when I stopped doing my research. Thank you for watching Kent's Corner. This is the everybody's favorite show on the internet. Thanks, Kent. That was super not helpful. You're welcome. I'm a big research guy. You can't become an expert at something without experience, but I like to be as close to expert as possible just through research before I dive into something. And there are a ton of python species and just snake species in general that I love. But I knew that my next species needed to have a really great story that sort of ignites my passion for the animal. And also, you know, some snakes take a really long time to grow up to breed. Some of them are really hard to breed. Uh, so that's not really my number one thought as far as right now, even though I, you know, I do want to breed these snakes. Uh, but the point is, it's got to be a good fit for the green room pythons family. In other words, it's got to be a good pet. It's got to be something really cool that I can handle and interact with. Some of you already know what I got just based on this box because you're snake nerds. But let me just tell this really cool story while I unbox the newest member of the green room pythons family. The longest snake in the world is the reticulated python, which is almost as heavy as the largest snake in the world, which is the anaconda. And in hearing this, you might think, yeah, that's probably not a good pet for somebody, a snake that can get over 20 feet long at times and weigh a couple hundred pounds. There's probably just a handful of people in the country that can handle a snake that size. And yet, Reticulated pythons are one of the most popular snakes in the pet trade. People buy them, oftentimes not understanding what they're getting. Now, if you own mainland reticulated pythons or Burmese pythons or whatever, and you've got a good setup, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about the people that uh, go to a show and they buy this baby snake because it's really cool and they hear how big it's gonna get, but then a few years down the road, they're like, oh, that's what 15 feet is. Wow, I hope it doesn't get any bigger because I don't think I can keep this snake anymore. So that's a big problem. I've said for a long time that I don't think as many people should be keeping 
snakes of this size. It's really hard to keep a snake like that. It, you, you need more than one person to even move it. You need massive caging. But on the other hand, reticulated pythons are awesome. They are one of the most beautiful snakes in the world. Reticulated refers to their pattern, uh, the, the sort of netting type pattern on the snakes, and their colors are bright and brilliant. And they, unlike ball, py ball pythons, come out of the egg bright and they typically get duller as they age. Reticulated pythons are the opposite. They get brighter with age. And they're incredibly smart. They're, they're trainable, just really inquisitive, intelligent snakes. They're super cool, just way too big. Okay, you guys, yes, it was 10.30 in the morning. All right, but in my defense, A, Garrett sent me a Reach Out Reptile shot glass, and B, one of my grandmother's favorite sayings was always, if someone sends you a shot glass in the mail, you use it. She used to say that all the time. It's her favorite, favorite saying. If only there was like an archipelago of islands that had just really small reticulated pythons. Well, guess what? We're in luck because there is. Indonesia is home to a small chain of islands that have sort of each island has their own little race of reticulated pythons. And as the islands get smaller, the reticulated pythons get smaller. These are called dwarf and super dwarf reticulated pythons. Now, super dwarf isn't like um, super pastel or super inchy. We're not talking about the homozygous form of a gene. These are localities that grow this size. Some say that they grow this size because of the lack of larger food. You know, a, a mainland reticulated python will eat a deer or whatever it can, you know, get. They can fit a large item in their body. These smaller islands don't have deer or whatever other large prey. So they're eating like birds and small rodents and things like that. And over thousands of years, they've gotten smaller. These names, dwarf and super dwarf, are just terms. It's like somebody landed on Slayer Island and looked at the snakes and went, oh my gosh, that's an adult? That's like a, that's like a dwarf reticulated python. And then they went to Jampea Island and they were even a little bit smaller and they went, well, that's a, that's a dwarf too. Then they landed on Kalatoa Island and they went, oh my gosh, these are super small. These are like super dwarf reticulated pythons. And they went to Madu Island and they were even smaller. And they went to Karampa Island and tiniest super dwarfs, the rarest. Now this is a small island. We're talking Karampa Island is uh, about the size of Disneyland. Disneyland is 500 acres. And I would say that when the tide's out, Karampa, I think it's called Karampa Lopo or Lopo Karampa or something like that. Anyway, uh, that island is with the tide out, maybe 500 acres. It's tiny. It's basically coral reef with a bunch of manzanita trees and this little tiny population of reticulated pythons. They're exceedingly rare. There's only five or six, I think there's six now, pure Karampa breeding adults in the United States. I mean, I would say Un unobtainable right now, I think, to get a pure Karampa. Garrett Hartle at Reach Out Reptiles is the proud keeper of several of these pure Karampas. And this year he hatched out a clutch of 50% Karampa, 25% Kalatoa, so that's 75% Super Dwarf total, and 12.5% Slayer Island, which is, which is a dwarf island, uh, snakes. And his plan was to keep all of the females. And he ended up with a lot of females in that clutch. And I called him at the right time and he was generous enough to provide me with one of the girls. Um, I mean, I bought it, but anyway, it, thanks Garrett. I'm super excited about this. I think Garrett and I are the only ones that have these, uh, these females. So this is going to be a very tiny little girl. We're talking a snake that's the th thickness of a corn snake. So uh, balled up, much smaller than Damara, probably much smaller than Freya as well. So after months of research, I decided to get my snake from Garrett because he has built a really cool company and he's doing great things with the snakes for one thing, but also with educating people about this species. And that's the kind of company that I want to support and I will continue to support. 
uh, him. He's he's doing awesome stuff and uh, has a great YouTube channel. So if you want to learn from the horse's mouth, so to speak, about super dwarf free ticks and dwarf free ticks, uh, check out Reach Out Reptiles on YouTube. So different than ball pythons in that super dwarf free ticks have not only morphs, but localities that are important in, in their breeding. And this girl is a wild type, but she's got some awesome localities uh, as we talked about. So she won't be ready to breed for four, maybe we could start thinking about breeding her in four years, but probably more like five years. Some wait until six years before they can breed. So I'm not even thinking about breeding right now. I mean, I, I know what I want to do in the future. I've got that sort of planned out. But right now, she is just a member of the Green Room Pythons family, and she's hanging out. Uh, and you'll see some video updates. We'll occasionally do a Super Dwarf video mixed in with all these ball python videos. Ken, do you have anything to say about this? It looks poisonous. Her name is Echo, and I love her already. Thanks for watching. <laughs>